Welcome to this virtual talk. My name is Mary Weiss. I am a member of the board of the Friends of Westerly Library in Wilcox Park. And in partnership with the Western Library, we are presenting this video uh, Zoom virtual author talk this evening with John Hemingway. We will be discussing his sixth book, In Full Flight, A Story of Africa and Atonement, which was published in February 2018. By way of introduction, John is coming to us from Bozeman, Montana. However, I consider him a local author because his family lived in Watch Hill for many years, a place that John calls his spiritual home. He graduated from Princeton University in 1966. He was also educated in New York, Massachusetts, and Switzerland. He is fluent in French, which helped him immeasurably in writing this book. John is a journalist, author, and filmmaker. He has made over 200 documentaries. He has won numerous prestigious awards. He has produced films from, among others, Walt Disney, PBS, and National Geographic. John has been on the board of the many wildlife and conservation groups, including the Africa Wildlife Federation. He teaches storytelling at Montana State University. The story, storytelling is an important element of this book in particular. In John's books and films, beginning in 1980, he often told a story admiring a woman doctor who flew a plane around Kenya providing free medical services to the rural poor. Over 50 years, the doctor had treated more than 1 million people. It was in the year, one year after her death in 1999 that John made a shocking discovery. Now this is someone he had known for 20 years about this doctor. John, I don't know if you want to start as early on at this point about what your discovery was and how you discovered it, but it really perhaps will set the tone for your conversation with us tonight. Right. Mary, thank you so much, and thank you, Bethany. <clears throat> I have to tell you that um, when I wrote my first book, um, I, I did it in Watch Hill, and I've often come into the Wesley Library um, for um, those of the days that things weren't online and you had to come in and you had library cards and all that sort of wonderful thing. And I just love that building and I love the people who ran it then as I, I'm, I'm sure I, I do today. So really I'm thrilled and honored to be part of that. Um, <clears throat> so I'll tell one little, uh, one little factoid Although what I'd like to do is just for the sake of, of a little drama here, if, if you could indulge me by allowing me to read just the first six pages of the book, because it sets this, the scene um, uh, for so much. And I'm assuming that while some of you have read the book, a few of you have not, and in which case, if I could just read these uh, few pages, um, and then I will tell you what I discovered in uh, the year 2000. Um, this is the prologue. It's, it's called The End. On February 6, 1999, a mob of yellow-billed kites circled Wilson Airport in Kenya, the busiest civil aviation hub in all Africa. The carrion birds had just left the nearby Nairobi slum of Kibera and were exploiting an uncommon void in the airspace over the runways. They might have been honor guards as they circled above a cortege of land cruisers, sedans, and buses out of which poured mourners, women in dated frocks, and men stiff in regimental blazers, shiny at the elbow from age. Here and there, Ismaili and Sikh woman, women exiting minivans arranged their saris. The great majority of arrivals were Africans dressed in clothes reserved for church, weddings, and death. Within the hangar, only a few found seats. Otherwise, it was standing room only. None could recall Wilson Airport so hushed with all the airplanes tied down 
as a mark of respect. East Africa was in mourning for its celebrated flying doctor, Anne Spurry, fell by a stroke four days previously at age 80, still in harness to her lights calling, helping the rural poor. Over a thousand people found space in the flying doctor's hangar to pay last respects. The ceremony rang with the solemnity of a state funeral. Many had traveled from overseas and no sector of Kenyan society was lacking. Infants strapped to their mother's backs, creaky limbed elb elders, a colorful array of tribes, Asian merchants, Europeans, Americans, government ministers, the diplomatic corps, and unattended children all jostled for sight lines in the echoing metal building. Dr. Ann Spurry had spent nearly 50 years in Africa, tending to the health of over a million patients, drawn mostly from the far corners of Kenya. It was said no other physician could match her industry, tenacity and productivity in the cause of Africa's well-being. As a sole lifeline for the poor, it was not uncommon for patients to declare her a saint. In the hangar, the mourners were a study in devotion, stifling coughs, eyes flickering from emotion, minds reliving the triumphs of her life. The sight of Spurry's Piper Lance PA-32 plane, known throughout Kenya as Zulu Tango, Tango for, from its call sign, Five Yankee Alpha Zulu Tango, drew many to reach for handkerchiefs. Positioned front and center, both coffin and airplane were draped in tropical garlands. For those who once awaited Anne on ribbon-thin airstrips, this Africa scarred machine spoke of endurance and courage. Zulu Tango had been their sole glimmer of hope in a land begging for miracles. Over the course of Spurry's long career, no place had been too far no airstrip too risky, no patient beyond caring. Inside the echoing hangar, eulogies ran long, with every speaker heaping praise on the doctor for her no-nonsense style, strength, and compassion. An elderly woman whose broken arm Dr. Spurry had set years before likened her to Mother Teresa. Another called her an angel from heaven. Wherever she landed, she was greeted as Mama Doctari, Mother Doctor, a sobriquet that met with Anne's hearty approval. When an unscheduled speaker, footsore from travel, rushed the podium, mourners checked their programs to see if they had missed something. He was a tall, dignified farmer, dressed in his one suit, confected with the red dust of Africa, and a tie that was black and borrowed. All leaned forward to hear his love sonnet. In linen soft words, he declared that Dr. Spurry had saved not just him, but entire villages. He was here at the urging of his community to reassure all Dr. Spurry would never be forgotten, not in the far corners of Africa, in this generation, or the next. When he finished with a barely audible God bless you, Mama Doctari. The Kenya Boys Choir burst into Ave Maria. Soon the chanting bridged into a song of old Africa with one lone alto repeating, Ka Maishu Marefu, live forever, against an alto chorus and the beating aorta of a drum. The finale cued six strong men to lever open the hangar doors and as they did, a laser beam of noonday sun formed a corona over Zulu Tango, prompting a woman to confide, the doors of heaven just opened. Pallbearers hoisted the casket into the hold, then jockeyed the plane onto the apron. Outside, a throng of Wilson Airport personnel, most in coveralls, bowed their heads to honor the woman who for over 35 years, they had guided safely home. Dispensing with pre-flight checks, the flying doctor's chief pilot, Jim Heather Hayes, fired up Zulu Tango's engine and was soon airborne. 
Almost immediately, he dropped a wing and banked hard. He had one last time-honored African ritual to perform before setting off for an Indian Ocean island 290 miles to the east. Leaning in into the controls, he drove Zulu Tango at the hangar, scattering the kites and missing the roof by mere feet. Later, he recalled that as he rocketed over the heads of the mourners, the fluttering white handkerchiefs evoked a white-capped sea. Once he had burst through equatorial clouds, Heather Hayes set a course for the coast. From the ground, even when Zulu Tango was a mere pinprick, a few mourners continued to wave as if trying to will Anshbury back for one last farewell. Many viewed her final flight as a death knell of individualism, a paean to an older Africa of boundless dreams and extravagant passions. But Africa has a gift for concealment. This funeral was not only a tribute to a much loved caregiver, but also a triumph of transformation. In 1948, when Anne Sperry set foot in Africa for the first time, she was consumed by two dreams. One was to disappear, the other to start over. Admittedly, she was not the first to use the continent for cover. With great spaces and laws begging to be broken, Africa lends itself to secrets. In Anne's case, it rearranged a past of staggering complexity into a future of endless possibilities. Even now, after half a century, her secrets were still safe. Among those who loved her, and I include myself, no one knew what plights she once faced, how she had survived them, or the miraculous way she reinvented herself on this continent of endless beginnings. At the time of Anne's death, I, like the rest, believed her decades in Africa was the only narrative that counted. So overcome was I by Africa's loving farewell and my own fresh memories of her, I would set out to write her biography. In it, I would showcase the exponential power of the individual, how one astonishing soul can bring hope to the world's forgotten on a colossal scale. Mine would be a tribute to Anne's indefatigable will to better the lives of the downtrodden, an affectionate memoir of a blazing career propelled by idealism on the greatest stage of all, Africa. Then I learned the truth. <clears throat> so, um, in 2000, in the year 2000, uh, December, I was in Lamu with my wife, we on, on our honeymoon. And um, Lamu had been a favorite place of mine for many years. And I wanted to show her this, this magic island. <clears throat> and there, um, and it's also where Anne had had a series of houses. She was really quite a wealthy lady, and um, she um, she dabbled in real estate in Kenya, and one of those places was in Lamu. And out of the blue, I ran into her nephew, uh, Bauer and um, we chatted away. I told Bernard how sad I was uh, at the death of his wonderful aunt, and. Then I said, well, now, you know, in all the years I knew her, every time I asked her about World War II, she, she wouldn't, um, she would either shout me out of the way and tell me to change the subject because she wasn't interested in talking, or she would very adroitly skip it. And I never got any sense that she'd ever want to talk about it her time in World War II, even though one had heard rumors that she had been in the resistance and had had trouble. 
And Bernard said, well, nobody in my family knows anything now. My father knew everything, but he died one month before her and he took all his secrets to the grave. Um, however, I inherited her farmhouse up in Sabukia. And, uh, and in that farmhouse, there were two safes. And in one of them, uh, there was a far, uh, there was a, um, a big file, but yay big. And on the cover of it says, do not open. Would you like to look at it? Of course. So about a week later, I got, um, I, I, I was sent the file and um, I opened it and the covering page on that file was, uh, was uh, three pages and it was um, headed Crowcast, Central Registry of War Criminals and Security Suspects, dated 1947. And I looked down the list and there was Norwegians, there were Belgians, there were French, there were Germans. There was only one Swiss, Anne-Marie Spurry, wanted for crimes against humanity, including torture. And that was what turned my entire life for about 18 years upside down. And I had to find out the truth. And Maybe that, you could tell us about that process, John, because it seems like you were going on your own journey yourself as you're trying to reconcile the woman you knew as you so beautifully read in your introduction to your book and this cold file that was telling you something different right well um i mean mary i was uh i was astounded you know it's it sort of like uh uh being told that a member of your family uh uh had been in prison and nobody had mentioned this before it was just like uh, how could that possibly do? I mean, the this woman who was um, an, as as great an altruist and and uh, uh, a a um, um, you know a, a caretaker of of the the most uh, needy people in the world. How could she possibly be wanted for crimes against humanity? So, I am. Um, um, I then set off on this extraordinary chase. It took me across um, uh, much of Europe. I, um, I began in Switzerland and I, there in, in the files in, in Basel and in Zurich. Uh, and um, I also was in the uh, war crimes tri uh, 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 archives in Kew, um, which is just beside the Kew Gardens outside of London or on the edge of London. And, um, and then of course I went to Ravensbrook. Now, um, does, I, uh, I wonder if, if everybody has heard about Ravensbrook. I um, think you say many of us have, but many have not. So it'd be helpful to give a little background, John. Yeah. Um, so we all know about Auschwitz and we all know about, um, uh, Bergen Belson and uh, <clears throat> and other <clears throat> of the f infamous infamous um, concentration camps. Um, Ravensbrück um, was was the only camp that was for women only. A hundred and twenty three thousand, I believe, the number went through it, and only seventeen thousand survived. Um, it um, it was. Uh, um, finally liberated by the Russians in uh, April of 1945. Um, and uh, uh, the, the bunkers, the, uh, uh, the blocks, were uh, the Russians tried to camp in them and they were so disgusting that they burnt them down. So nothing of that was ever left. Um, but I went there. And I stood on the site of Block 10, where a lot of the action in the book takes place. Block Just for a moment, John, is, is Robin's book in Germany, near Berlin? Where is it located? Um, well, it would have been in East Germany, um, now in Germany. 
Um, it's about um, uh, 60 miles north, northeast of uh, Berlin. I flew into Berlin and then I drove from there. And it's about equidistant from Hamburg. So in winter, you would get the, uh, um, the cold winds off the Baltic. And, uh, and it's, it's really uh, tormenting because when you get there, you get to this little village called Fürstenberg, which is the most beautiful little village you've ever seen. Um, and when I was there, I was there on May Day, by the way, there were um, uh, people out on the lake uh, rowing these little pedal boats and there were uh, swans um, gracing the lake, the surface of the lake. It was so beautiful. But then if you looked a little more carefully, you would see these brick walls and it is, and that was Ravensbrook. Um, and you, um, and, and the number of accounts that I've read of people who were offloaded from these cattle cars at the station in Furstenberg and then walked goose-stepped across the frozen ground and snow to um, the, the front gate at uh, Furstenberg. And there it is. It is just one of the most, if you, I, I have to say that going to Ravensbrook was a life-changing event for me. Um, I, I walked through it on a, you, you know, you, you have to book to get into Auschwitz, but nobody goes to, um, uh, to Ravensbrück because it's not as it's not at the uh, on the on the, on the high list of infamous places, even though it should be. Uh, when I was there, there were a number of elderly ladies, some with walkers, some with canes. Most of them with what I assumed were members of their family, and they they would circle the interior courtyard where these blocks. Uh, these dreaded blocks had been, and they would point out bullet holes and various things in the uh, in the in the in the, in the guard houses all around, um, and um, they wouldn't say much. It was sort of like a, and and their grandkids would be at their elbow and 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 staring at this thing in in disbelief, and I can remember them going to this this alleyway. Um, that was really quite close to block 10 and um, and pointing out all the bullet holes there because that was where um, they they had a firing squad and something like 10,000 women were shot dead in that little thing. And I also remember going to the crematorium and watching this wonderfully distinguished old lady um, with a with a, a bouquet of roses and she couldn't get down to place them on the crematorium. And her little granddaughter, I assume her granddaughter, took them and placed them at the foot of the crematorium. Um, obviously, and you know, obviously I, I was reading into this site uh, what I, th I think was the logical conclusion that these were um, women who had survived Ravensbrook and they were um, telling their, showing their family um, what it was that they had endured, and also um, hoping that the new generation, represented by their grandkids, uh, would would um, uh, make sure that the world never saw anything like this ever again. Now, John, at this point, had you actually met with some of the survivors from Robinsbrook so you could envision what this place looked like now that it had been? No, oh, I, I hadn't. I hadn't. And, uh, but then I was able to track down um, um, three survivors. Um, uh, but one of the most interesting ones was a woman called Odette Walling. Um, and um, and I, I, I tracked her down because it, after the war, she had spent some time on Cape Cod of all places. She had been married to, uh, she came out of the camp and she was married to um, an American uh, diplomat and they lived um, on the Cape. Uh, but then suddenly I discovered that her son was quite a famous uh, jewelry designer in New York um, and uh, known by friends of mine. So I got to know Christopher Walling and, um, and I was introduced to his mother that way. And I flew to, 
So I, I, I called her up and I said, um, Madam Walling, I uh, introduced myself and I said, um, I'd like to come to uh, Paris and, and take you out for lunch. And she said, I never go out of my apartment. Um, and I said, well, may I come to your, to your apartment and see you and meet with you and talk with you? She said, yes. And I got on a plane the next day and I flew there. It turns out she, ever since the war and ever since Ravensbrück, she suffered from uh, extreme agoraphobia. And her son, her son said that as he grew up, there was never a day that went by that she didn't mention concentration camp in it. And for many, many years, he thought it was one word. Um, and um, and um, when I spoke to Odette, it was really the most heart-wrenching story of all. Um, she said that um, uh, she was a famous model in Paris before, and uh, um, she was in the underground and got caught and was one of those prisoners who um, was uh, was convicted under Hitler's rules called Nacht und Nebel, um, uh, 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 night and, and fog. And in other words, he would take individuals who were um, uh, who were uh, enemies of of the Third Reich, and they would disappear into the night and the fog. Um, and um, and she disappeared into uh, Ravensbrück. Uh, she said that. Um, um, Ravensbrook uh, changed her life and that it destroyed her life. Her life was destroyed because of, and she told these horrific stories of, of all sorts of things going on in Ravensbrook. Uh, she knew Anne and that's why it was so important. Uh, but the, the one woman who really came through and, and I, who I think about still to this day um, was called Louise Laporte, and I met her in Bordeaux. And she was um, uh, a family doctor, now retired, very distinguished lady, really wonderful. And she had been in Block 10 with Anne and had actually been at one point in a, uh, Anne was a medical doctor, uh, sorry, a, 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 um, a student doctor. She was a student doctor, medical student at that time. Uh, but she was, uh, as I'll explain, she was given special privileges. And, uh, and she was in a room in an area very close to um, Louise Laporte. So Louise was uh, one of the most credible witnesses of all. And she witnessed unspeakable things. And I was so moved by uh, Louise that I went down and I interviewed her not once but four times. Sadly, uh, Dr. Laporte is no longer with us, nor Odette, um, nor any of the witnesses to Block 10. They're all gone. So I was so lucky to meet them. And they told me, uh, they gave me insights into Ravensbrook, but also into the personality of Anne Sperry. So maybe we could step back a little bit so that our folks who haven't read the book perhaps get a little more context. How was it that Anne ended up at Ravensbrook, right. uh, this horrible place that you were describing? So Anne was a, a medical student living in Paris um, in, a, in a beautiful apartment overlooking the, uh, the Seine, well, much of the time with her brother, who was an architectural student. And um, uh, and in nineteen uh, and she uh, and and Francois uh, became a member in in uh, let's see nineteen forty two I believe he became a member of the underground um, and the resi resistance um, and he he, um, uh, he and he. Um, uh, he got Anne to join, and Anne joined in uh, in nineteen uh, in nineteen forty at the end of nineteen forty three, um, and uh, and she was active in Paris. Um, 
she created a kind of a safe house for British pilots. Um, and um, one of whom had a, a shortwave radio and was in communication with London. Um, she, uh, she went underground and they, and they disrupted German life in Paris as much as possible. And then in March of that year, um, after three really brave months of work as a, as a, a part of the Maquis, the, uh, the Resistance, uh, she got caught. And, um, and she was uh, taken to uh, uh, this horrible place on the Rue de Saucy, Saucy um, in Paris, which was the German, um, uh, the Nazi headquarters. And um, probably tortured there. And then she was sent to a prison called Fren, just outside of Paris. And um, she was there for about um, um, eight months. I've got, I've given you one mistake here. Um, that was in 1943. And she was there in Fren until 1944, when she was transported along with a lot of other women uh, to Ravensbrück. And she was in, in Ravensbrück from um, from March of 44 all the way through to April of 45. Um, and, um, and I have to say that for most of that time, um, you know, she'd been trained as a doctor and she didn't have a medical degree. She was years away from that, but uh, she was on her way to becoming a, a doctor and she came from a really good family of uh, sort of uh, haute bourgeoisie, as the French would call it, um, you know, they they were uh, a family who uh, were in textiles and were wealthy on both sides of the family, her mother and her father's. And um, she lived in a, her base was in Mulhouse, and she had also Swiss passport, and they had another place on the lake of uh, Zurich, uh, near Zurich in, in Switzerland. And um, so they had and they had a place in the south of France. So they had three major places um, and obviously a wealthy family. Um, and, uh, uh, and so, uh, and, and she was brought up very correctly. And so everything was, uh, you know, she helped others. Everything went along until August of 1944. She's in the infirmary and she encounters a woman called Carmen Mori. Now you can look up Carmen Mori, um, and you will you will see a number of references to her. She was a fellow Swiss, and that must have been part of the attraction the two found, um, and or, or at least something that brought them together because they had much to discuss about how wonderful Switzerland was, but. Uh, Carmen Mori was a double agent. Uh, she had uh, worked for both the Germans uh, as a spy and for the French as a spy, and she got caught. Um, she had numerous affairs uh, with um, members of the Third Reich, very highly placed um, uh, uh, people, including quite possibly Reinhold uh, Ehrlich, uh, uh, Heydrich, sorry, Reinhold Heydrich, and you can look him up. Um, he was called the Butcher of Prague. He was one of the most vicious human beings you ever uh, um, ever could come up with, and apparently was credited with the authorship of that expression, the final solution. Um, any case, um, but she was thrown into Ravensbrück because she was, uh, as far as the Germans were con concerned, a, uh, a high risk. She befriended Anne, and um, and Carmen was absolutely um, she she was a uh, um, uh, she she was a seductress, and um, she spoke six languages. She had allegedly a very fine alto voice and she would often break into song. She wanted to become um, a sort of, uh, she 
imagined herself on the same stage as Marlena Dietrich. And she uh, had this seduct uh, uh, this wonderfully seductive voice. And she sang a lot of, um, um, of um, uh, Cole Porter songs in, in English and she'd break into French and German and sometimes Italian and she was really charming. Um, and Anne completely fell for uh, Carmen. And in September of 1944, uh, Carmen was made the block elder of block 10. What a block elder was, uh, block altessa is the German word for it, is essentially the, um, a member of the, uh, I mean, a prisoner who had gained the trust of the Nazi guards and was considered, was considered to have um, administrative qualities that would make her um, uh, the leader of, of this block. What it also inferred is that uh, being a block elder uh, made you an informer on everything that was going on inside the block and for which you were given certain advantages. One of them was that you would have virtually your own room in these uh, uh, hideous blocks and um, others that you would also be given uh, 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 you know, good food from time to time. And um, in any case, um, uh, uh, Carmen fired the existing doctor of block 10. It was for tuberculars and for lunatics. And there was a qualified doctor, prisoner, a Polish doctor there, and she fired her and she made Anne the doctor of block 10, even though Anne had really no qualifications. And giving her a new name, didn't she? A new identity? It gave, gave her a new new name. Uh, it was um, Dr. Claude. Uh, just think about that. That's a really, um, and it's rather ambiguous sec sexually. And I, I won't go there, but, but the book will go there. We'll take you there in a big way. And, um, and, and between the two of them, they did the bidding of the, um, German High Command, and they did the bid bidding of the guards, um, and uh, and this amounted to, um, and was just between the months of September up until exactly the 31st of December, 1944, um, when both Anne and Carmen uh, were removed from Block 10. Um, in Carmen's case, for her protection, because it was clear the Allies were about to, uh, uh, were moving, were doing an intermovement from both sides and, and Germany was doomed. And as you know, Auschwitz was liberated at the end of January. So that, it, they saw it all coming. So because she was a friend of the guards, they sent Carmen Mori off to a special, uh, to another camp where her, her history would be forgotten. What was that history over those four months of uh, those dreaded four months. The two were accused of um, torture, of brutality of, of an order that you can't imagine, and um, the injection of, um, of uh, EpiPen, which is a barbiturate. And when you, uh, when you give it as an overdose, it kills. And also injections of air to a number of, um, of prisoners as well as the, um, uh, as the uh, um, uh, identification of um, individuals that Carmen and Anne thought should be taken off to the gas chamber. That all happened in those four months. And on January 1st, Anne was removed and went to uh, block six. Uh, where she dropped her name of Dr. Claude and she once again became Anne Sperry and um, was transformed into once again a um, benevolent doctor um, who was willing to help everybody. And um, uh, both um, Carmen in her own way 
and she never saw Carmen again, as far as I can uh, could determine. Um, and then on the 25th of April of 1945, um, Anne was uh, the uh, the Swedish Red Cross um, took about 600 prisoners who were still alive, and they took them to freedom uh, in in Switzerland, and um, and it was uh, uh, and that was the transforming moment of Anne's life, and she and she returned home, a sort of a shadow of herself, but as everybody said. She looked ex quite well fed, even then, whereas everybody else were cadavers. Um, and so Anne had benefited greatly from her friendship with Carmen Mori. Um, and after the war, there would be, um, I, I don't think I'm getting ahead of myself, uh, but uh, uh, there, were, there were three trials. Uh, there was a, a trial uh, actually, Anne was thrown into prison in, in Switzerland um, during a time when Carmen Mori was um, in prison in Hamburg. Um, and the, the Hamburg war crimes trial is not as well known as Nuremberg, but it was uh, similar. And there were 15 individuals on trial. and. Um, is that because it was conducted by the British, Don? And, uh, it was all conducted in... by the British military, yes. Whereas um, Nuremberg was a combination of the Allies, mostly Americans, and uh, there were some British uh, and Americans combined. Um, there were no Russians, as far as I know, but those two Allies were there, as well as some French. But, in, uh, but Hamburg was completely uh, a British... Uh, military tribunal and um, there were I think six judges uh, sitting um, together and um, any case all uh, one of these um, of, of the suspects um, uh, died in prison uh, but the others uh, I think only one or two were acquitted everyone else uh, was condemned to death to be hanged including Carmen. And that included Carmen Mori. Yeah. And, um, and, um, uh, and during all this time, uh, I was able, I was able to um, accumulate all these extraordinary letters that Carmen wrote and begging her to come to her assistance, uh, begging to, uh, uh, to um, uh, stand as a witness in Hamburg, something that um, that Anne would not do on the advice of her own legal counsel, and and then um, so uh, I'll end with uh, Carmen Mori <coughs> uh, uh, with uh, uh, slit her wrist um, one week before she was to be hanged and was found dead. Um, uh, uh, on the floor of her cell with a hundred pieces of clothing, including a famous fox fur that she would wear whenever she uh, uh, was in the witness stand in Hamburg. Um, and there's a novel written about Carmen Mori in German only, um, and it's called The Woman in Fur. Um, and, um, but, um, and there was, were several trials, were there not? There was the, the British military, the French military, the Swiss military, and then the French resistance. And Anne's name would come up from time to time, but only she was charged in Switzerland. Is that correct? Well, no, actually, it was just the French and the Swiss, okay. um, where uh, there was uh, a French, uh, oh, sorry, a Swiss a uh, civil um, uh, court and there was a French military court with three judges. And there was this uh, Cour d'honneur, which is a, a court of honor, or honor court uh, that was conducted in, in, um, in France, in Paris. Um, and that was the only one uh, where Anne showed up. Um, on, on the advice, uh, her father mounted a tremendous 
uh, legal team. Um, and, um, and one of the things they were able to do is they were able to accumulate a great number of witnesses to Anne's behavior before and after she went into Block 10. The, the, um, um, uh, the, on the other side, uh, were, were, um, uh, there were, uh, I think, 12 witnesses uh, who, um, who described her conduct in Block 10. And it was horrific what they said. But uh, there were 22 who talked about how great she was in uh, all these other blocks. And as a result, both the French and the Swiss um, concluded at the end that um, she, uh, to acquit her on the basis of lack of evidence. However, so her passports weren't taken. She was not convicted. She was not found liable. Yeah, yeah. Um, and she was not found, but lack of evidence. And, um, uh, but the, the cool d'honneur, which she did attend, much to the regret of her legal counsel, um, she, um, they, they accused her of, of um, a number of things, uh, hurting, uh, uh, impacting the health and lives of fellow Frenchmen, um, and um, bringing uh, shame on the resistance, and also uh, posing as a doctor when she wasn't a doctor, and, um, and um, uh, torturing and killing people. And, um, and she was charged with that, and she uh, confessed and said that she would uh, that she would spend the rest of her life helping uh, the the uh, the lepers of Africa, and you know she said that because it was probably a very very astute and uh, uh, powerful line. Uh, it didn't work out that way, but uh, that's what she said she would do, and the um, her punishment was that she was never to return to France for either 25 or 40 years. Uh, she was never to practice medicine in France or in any of its dependencies. Um, and that she was never to invoke the name of the resistance uh, when she talked about herself. Um, and- um, uh, They weren't a law enforcement body. There was no way for them to enforce any of these no. verdict or whatever we'll call their judgment. Yeah. I understood she did go back to France and she did practice, not in France, but she practiced medicine under the false pretense of being a doctor. Yeah, to begin with, yes. And, uh, and so she went off to, uh, uh, she, uh, in, in um, 1947, 48, uh, she, uh, uh, through family connections, she boarded a boat in Bordeaux and she, uh, uh, in Marseille, and um, she uh, went to Aden, uh, which was a colony of Britain at the time. And um, she practiced medicine there, and she practiced medicine on these uh, pilgrim ships going to, Medi uh, to Mecca, um, to the port of Mecca, Jeddah. And, um, and then she, um, uh, she eventually made her way to Ethiopia. She fell in love with Africa. Uh, but couldn't practice medicine in Ethiopia, or dis determined she couldn't, and uh, eventually went to Kenya, where she uh, fell in love with it all over again, and, and set off and became a, a country doctor um, under her own name, but uh, in, a, in a little community that was quite a distance from Nairobi, uh, where she didn't think anybody would encounter her from her past. And she was correct. For, for I have some questions that are waiting for you, but I wanted to ask uh, a final question, if I may. The title of your book is in two parts, In Full Flight, A Story of Africa and Atonement. And perhaps you could break that down for us, the first half being in full flight. What flight was that? I'm sure. sure there are many different meanings to that. And then this atonement concept. Yeah. Well, uh, thanks, Mary, for that. Um, in full flight, really uh, relates to the fact that in 1964, uh, Anne learned how to fly, and she was, I think, 45 more or less at that time. Uh, so not 
uh, no, not a spring chicken to learn how to fly an airplane. And, um, and she fell in love with it and she found uh, this level of freedom that she had desired all her life. So she was, um, so flying was uh, a kind of an escape for her. Um, but uh, she came to Kenya because she fled France. Um, she she left France before the, um, uh, the, the 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 courts had reached judgment on her, and um, and and she was clearly not allowed to leave France, but she escaped on a um, uh, on a uh, I want to say a tramp steamer, but it was a cargo ship that took in twelve passengers, and um, uh, and 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 so she flew out of out of France, and then she flew for the rest of her life. And she found her her calling um, in flight, um, and so yeah. I mean, did I take a? Um, is it a stretch? I don't think it is, um, because that's what I saw her life to be. Now um, it's a story of Africa because I don't think that. I th I think Africa gave her cover. And it gave her this extraordinary protection that she wouldn't have had anywhere else. Had she stayed in France, um, which she couldn't have, or had she stayed in Switzerland, which she could have probably, um, she would have been, uh, there were very, there were a huge number of women who knew what she had done. And she would have been pilloried by the lot of them. Uh, she was when she uh, uh, tried to finish her exams in Paris, people would turn their backs on her. They would see her coming in the street. They would turn their backs. They couldn't abide her. She had gotten away with murder and they didn't want to have anything to do with her. So that would have been her Europe. But in Africa, in a British community of, of, uh, of good old boys who, uh, uh, you know, may have had a little past of their own, who knows that. Um, she was a um, delightful company and she could um, toss back a gin and tonic like the best of them in the um, in the local club she played polo um, she was a, a, a good horse horsewoman she was really quite an equestrian and um, and she was uh, uh, kind of a beloved doctor because you know she would get out in the middle of the night and see a patient and drive on muddy roads and if and if the roads were too muddy she'd get on the horseback and and do house calls that way she was really um, dedicated and, and really um, uh, loved. Uh, kids found her very, very intimidating. She, I mean, I spoke to a number of them and she said, I recall her coming at me with a, with a, a syringe that was, uh, was, was the kind they used on horses, um, <laughs> not humans. And, and I'd see this thing coming and, you know, the wailing that kids would, would get up to when they saw this thing coming their way. And, uh, and Ann Tuffer's nails would say, oh, shut up. Don't get over it. You know, don't be such a baby and bang into their bottom. And um, anyways, that was, um, that was Ann. Um, and but what about uh, this concept of atonement? Uh, atonement. Um, so I thought about this a lot. Uh, uh, I really, thought about this um, and struggle with it because I don't believe even though she said she would help the um, uh, the lepers I don't believe she left France uh, uh, intent on helping the letters the, the lepers I think she left France um, because she wanted to escape and she was advised to do exactly that by her father and he she was also advised that um, he had spent a lot of money getting her out of this incredible jam. And um, he said, you know, you're going to have to change yourself. You're going to have to start anew. Uh, this is, if you keep behaving this way, uh, it will end in misery for the family. And, um, and so she set out to remake herself. Um, and it's quite easy to remake yourself in Africa in the, um, in that um, in that world there, uh, and uh, uh, and so 
she uh, so she she fled and um, uh, and I think I think sometime in the 60s when she started to fly um, one gets the impression that she became almost consumed by helping people and um, and when I got to know her in 1980 and she was uh, say yeah, she was about 63 I think she was 63 then um, and she lived up until the age of 81 um, she was um, um, she was on this quest to just keep on going. I, I would ask her and I, I filmed her and I have this on tape. I said, um, when will you retire? And she said, um, you know, in America, people retire at a certain age, but you know, in Africa, they don't care about that age. As long as you can keep on doing things, they, they don't mind. They, they want you to keep on working. And I intend to keep on working. And as it were, she worked up until one week before her death. She was still flying. Uh, she was got her a, life her atonement then, John? Or was her, she never acknowledged, other than that one confession, uh, what she had done. She didn't. But um, I, I had long talks with this wonderful man called Ali Gabo, who was her nurse. Um, I mean, if, if, uh, if a nurse on two levels. First of all, he came to her at a time in her life when maybe 10 years before she died, she needed an assistant. And he was her nurse on these missions that she would conduct on the coast particularly. Um, and then eventually when she became her knees packed up and she couldn't get around and uh, she was going blind and certainly deaf, um, he was, he, he assisted her. He told me that towards the end of her life, all she could think about was Ravensbrook. And that she began to write a book uh, about Ravensbrook. Uh, and her way of doing the book is she, she made six drawings, six rather detailed drawings of her memories of, of Ravensbrook. Uh, and, um, and that's where it began. And, and, uh, and she was uh, intent to Maybe to tell her story, maybe not. But it was about that time that um, a, a young, uh, uh, young woman called Bettina Durer wrote a, uh, uh, her, her master's thesis at the University of Heidelberg. And um, it was all about Carmen Mori, but it was in large part about Anne and about Anne's complicity and everything that Maury had done. And um, she, uh, I got to know uh, uh, Bettina and um, I, uh, I uh, um, so I asked her, I said, um, uh, what, what about um, Anne? And she said, well, I contacted the Swiss ambassador in uh, Nairobi and asked to find out where she lived and I was given some information and I sent her the document of the thesis and I have her copy which they're heavy underlinings and um, and and uh, she said at the end of the day uh, that uh, she was having breakfast one day in Zurich I guess it was and she read the morning newspaper and she saw this loving uh, story about Anne, about her, all her great work in Africa. And, um, and she said, I'm going to co uh, contact her. So she called her up and she said, Dr. Spurry, uh, Bettina Durer, and uh, I've just written this thesis about Carmen Mori and I'd love to talk to you about it. And I never forget the way Bettina said what happened next. She said she could hear her breathing quite heavily on the end of the line, and then the line went dead. That was Anne's response. Well, John, uh, you've answered a lot of my questions. I think there are others from the audience. So, Bethany, do you want to uh, help us with those, please? 
Um, so we don't have any in the chat, but if anybody has um, a question for John, just unmute yourself and um, ask away. Uh, this is Patricia. I'm sorry, I sent my questions to Mary, which is the wrong the place to send them. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> Mary, you answered some of them, which is fantastic. But um, a couple of things. Was Ravenbrook for more for resistance women and people like that wasn't a Jewish um, concentration camp? Oh, no, it was a combination of, um, Anne was called a political prisoner. Got it. Um, then there were asocials, um, lesbians, um, prostitutes. Uh, but then there were uh, Poles, gypsies, uh, Seventh-day Adventists, and lots of Jews. Uh, I mean, okay. uh, but I can't, I, I'm, I think I may have seen the breakdown, but um, yeah, I mean, Jews were well represented. Uh, probably not at the highest, at, at the, in a percentage way, as um, at Auschwitz um, or Bergen-Belsen. Um, uh, but but th there were lots of, uh, it was a, a real um, Macedoine of women. And was there any indication that she actually was in love with Carmen, and was there a lesbian relationship there. And then following to that was, did she ever marry? Did she have children? It sounds as though she didn't. And did she live a comfortable life in Africa? Did her parents give her money? Or did she really, was that part of her atonement that she gave up all the trappings that went along with her haute bourgeois you know, upbringing? Yeah. Well, uh, there are a lot of questions there. Uh, <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> So uh, I'll try to uh, be able to answer them all. Uh, the, um, uh, her relationship with Carmen um, was, um, uh, yeah, I will say, uh, I, I kind of want you to read the book because it's, uh, it's, it's there. I just wanted uh, it for my own birthday present oh, okay. for myself. <laughs> okay, great. So I hope you got a hard cop, uh, cover. Um, the, uh, but in any case, uh, the, the um, uh, yes, um, and, and that's up to, for you to imagine, uh, but it was, um, it was, it was a very, um, um, there was enormous tenderness between these two women, but um, I'll have to say that Anne was, was really subservient all the time to um, Carmen, and um, so I think a, a, a shrink would come in and, um, and, and tell you that uh, one was kind of a dominatrix and sure. the other one was a, a, okay, so that, um, we've covered that, but the book covers it in, in uh, unfortunate detail. And um, um, uh, I remember the one about, uh, did she live comfortably? Yes, she did. And um, she lived very comfortably, her parents were, uh, she started off with a, with a, um, a, a kind of a, um, uh, you know, every month they had sent her money and they covered her and her father bought her her airplane. Uh, but uh, amazingly enough, her brother Francois was a, a very successful um, architect and um, he built, um, he built this resort uh, very near Saint Tropez, called Port Grimaud, and um, and Anne was very very dominated by her brother. And whenever he asked her anything, she would say yes. And he asked her to invest in Port Grimaud, which she did. And she would do one investment, then another investment, another investment. And it was one of the most inspired investments of all times. And she was. According to her nephew, she was rolling in money. And, um, but when you met her, you would never suspect that. Uh, I, I used to see her in jeans. Uh, she always wore the same kind of bush jacket and she had um, safari boots um, all, uh, on. And she, uh, when she conducted her thing, uh, her, her, her grand rounds in the bush, she wore kind of a baseball hat um, and, um, and, and she would drive uh, these um, Renaults uh, until they fell apart. Uh, 
she wasn't splashy, but she had a very comfortable farm at Sabukia. Um, she had, she began, she ended up as the largest landowner in a little place called Shella, just outside of Lamu. Um, and um, she had all, she built all these incredible kind of palaces there and lived there. Um, and then uh, she was talked into buying uh, this uh, quite a famous house next to the Mathega Club outside of Nairobi. And um, uh, it was uh, a fabulous place. Um, and she had a house there. So, um, but at the same time, I, I don't remember and you know, like at, at, at the coast, would she ever go and go swimming and enjoy what, what tourists did down there? No, but she it, did that. But, she was always but it, it's almost as though she, it wasn't really atonement. She was simply hiding. Well, I, w I would question that because I think that um, she struggled. I think that she, uh, you know, the few people who she confided in, most of them wouldn't talk to me. Um, mm. uh, made it clear that uh, she she struggled with this. She oh, struggled yeah. with mm -hmm. uh, with her past. Um, she never married, um, okay. and um, you might say, was she a lesbian? Um, I'm not the best of judges, but probably. Um, but uh, not a practicing one. I yeah. think that she, yeah. she had learned her lesson from Carmen Mori and she knew how dangerous any um, 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 any engagements like that would, would be for her. So but she- John, you had some very interesting stories about unique women in your book, which I'm sure that people will like to know about too that were in Anne's orbit. So there are women that she does talk about. They're men too, but these characters she seemed to collect. Oh, oh yeah. Now uh, they were with her Mary, for years. I won't go into Mary O'Shaughnessy, but there is a, 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 a woman who um, I, I just would have loved to have met. and um, and. Actually, I was in Africa at a time when she was there, and but we, we never crossed paths. Um, but again, an outs a huge, a really remarkable woman. And because of this book, uh, they um, the BBC has done a special program about her, and um, uh, we're all helping out to make a, a monument uh, to her um, as one of the heroes of World War II. So that's just another a secondary figure in, in the life of Anne. Well, now you have to tell us what about the movie that may be coming about and who's going to play Anne, which hey, I have hey. a hard time. Hello. Peg has a question, so go ahead, Peg. I'm, I'm go. sorry. John, I just, in, in speaking of atonement, um, one thing you didn't touch on in, in today's presentation was the extraordinary acts of kindness that Anne would bestow on some of the local Native's children. Um, yep without letting them know, taking care of their education. So the dichotomy of her evil ways versus her relatively atonement ways was to me a very interesting part of her personality, which led me not to exactly hate the woman, I have to say. Very right. complex, no black and white for me. Right. Well, you're absolutely right. And, and I should have mentioned that. I mean, there's still uh, people around uh, Sabukia uh, who are still dedicated uh, to Anne for what she did to help them through life. Uh, and there's a, a young man in, in London who's a, a prosperous accountant right now, who I interviewed, uh, who um, owes everything to Anne. And uh, uh, he speaks French too, because uh, she would send him off to stay with her sisters in Moulouse in the, in the summer. And um, and he came back um, with this kind of education and um, uh, yeah. So there was, um, there's a tremendous amount of, uh, of, of goodness in Anne and uh, uh, there are people who still owe her everything. So yeah, I mean, that's what makes it all the more complicated telling a story like this. Are there any other questions um, that Bethany has received or anyone wish to speak up and ask? 
There's nothing in the chat, but does anybody have any more questions? Patricia has something. Yeah, um, is this book um, being sold talking. at the, um, at, across from the, 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 the um, place in Watch Hill, across from the Goose? Uh, the art, the art, um, Avondale Arts. Yeah. Or is I it your other it. book that's being sold there? I don't know. I don't know, but I gave a talk there. Oh, time. you did? Okay, I'm going to pick it up there tomorrow. Your book is being sold there. I bought it there. Oh, my gosh. I'm going there tomorrow. If you, if Dick has one moment. quick question. One quick question. From you, would, you would have thought that uh, with her Calvinist background that you would have turned to the church. And I think in, in lieu of that, I think this whole experience was her way of atonement rather than religion was not, didn't seem to be very important to her. Um, Formalized religion. Yeah, uh, she actually came from a uh, Huguenot family, so mm -hmm. she was uh, she was brought up as Protestant, and um, uh, I uh, 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 she was not particularly uh, uh, churchly uh, when I knew her. But according to uh, uh, Mary and Degwa, who was with her, one of the one of her her wards, if you will, um, she. Um, uh, towards the end of her life, uh, she started reading the Bible, and she uh, um, obviously was was struggling with her own mortality at that point. And um, you know, it's not for me to say whether she was religious or not. I don't. Re I only remember her going to church for weddings and funerals. So, by the way, if you do buy this book, which we really hope everyone will. If you buy through the Savoy Bookshop, the library gets part of the proceeds. That's great to know. That's really nice. Oh, yes. nice. That's Chuck Royce, isn't it? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Uh, talk about generous people. That's really good. So um, uh, uh, the final thing, I guess, is that um, the, the book has been optioned as a film. Um, I was on the phone today to the screenwriter, a woman called Margaret Nagel, who you can look up. She's did another a, a, a film about Africa already called uh, The Good Lie. Uh, she's a very interesting uh, woman. And um, I was on the phone with her. And um, I was also, I got an email from uh, the woman who is signed to play the role of Anne in Africa, and that is Glenn Close. So it will be a film, not a documentary. It'll be a film, a feature film, yeah. Wow, cool. So. Well, John, it's been an absolute delight having you this evening and talking to our group. Um, you did not disappoint us, and we thank you, and also for those who attended this evening. Thank you all. Thank you so okay. much. Very, very much. It was very marvelous. Good. Thank you so much. I so enjoyed being with you. You're a great group. Thank Good you. Night, John.